Conrad Steiner, Doctor of Medicine. Tonight's story has the title, Who Search for Truth. Guardian of birth, healer of the sick, comforter of the aged. And the qualities of the worthy physician are three. The eye of an eagle, the heart of a lion, the hand of a woman. Our actual case history tonight concerns one aspect in the field of physiology. The object in point, a legal contract. It's dated October 19, 1832. It represents an agreement never duplicated in the history of man. The case in point, Alexis St. Martin, 19-year-old French-Canadian, occupation fur trapper. On the sixth day of June in the year 1822, he reached the trading post at Fort Mackinac, Michigan. Awaiting him there were money and trade goods in exchange for his friends. Also awaiting him was a most unusual destiny. Go to the hospital, get Dr. Beaumont. Hurry. Thus, in the early afternoon of June 6, 1822, William Beaumont, M.D., an obscure army surgeon pursuing his profession in the far reaches of the Michigan wilderness, strode into the crude back room of the Mackinac trading post and raised the curtain on one of the most admirable and most important dramas ever enacted in the field of medical science. And that drama is still with us today, every last detail, carefully annotated and preserved in William Beaumont's own handwriting. These are his words. This is his story as he himself set it down. Being then stationed at the garrison on the island, I was immediately called to the relief of Alexis St. Martin. When I arrived at the place, I found him senseless and apparently in a moribund state. The shotgun charge, consisting of powder and duck shot, was received in the left side at close distance. It had blown off and fractured the sixth rib about the middle anteriorly, fractured the fifth rib, ruptured the lower portion of the left lobe of the lungs and lacerated the stomach by a spicula of the rib that was blown through its coat. I also noted a portion of the lungs protruding through the external wound. Immediately below this, a portion of the stomach protruded. There was a puncture in this portion large enough to receive my forefinger. Alexis St. Martin, is that correct? Yeah. Came in early this morning. They say he's from Montreal, came down with one of the expeditions. Anyone with him? Friend or relative? No, he was alone. Oh, it's too bad. Oh, it was an accident. We're sure of that. I want him moved to the post hospital as soon as possible. And get a letter. Take him to the hospital. You think he still has a chance with a wound like that? I don't think he can live more than 36 hours. In the meantime, I still intend to do everything possible to keep him alive. Before moving the patient, St. Martin, I attempted to reduce the portions of the lungs and stomach which protruded from the wound. I found the lung was prevented from returning by the sharp point of the fractured rib, over which its membrane had caught fast. But by raising up the lung with the front finger of my left hand, I clipped off with my penknife and my right hand the sharp point of the rib, which enabled me to return the lung into the cavity of the thorax. After giving the wound a superficial dressing, the patient was moved to the post hospital, and in about an hour, I attended to dressing the wound more thoroughly not supposing it probable for him to survive the operation of extracting the fractured spicule of bones and other extraneous substances. But to my utter astonishment, he bore it without a struggle or without sinking. After that, I applied over the wound a carbonated fermenting poultice, changing it once every eight, 10, or 12 hours. The desired effect was achieved in less than 84 hours with a lively reaction commencing in about 24 hours. This reaction was accompanied with strong arterial action and high inflammatory symptoms of the system generally, more especially of violent pneumonia and inflammation of the lungs. Oh. Oh. El me. Bon dieu. The pain. Oh. Saint Mel. El Alexi. All right, son, lie quietly. Another few minutes now, I'll let you alone. Doctor. 
in what pain, pain. I told you to lie quietly. Now do as I say. I die. What praise? You must please get praise. He was here this afternoon. He'll be back again tonight. I die. I don't want death. I pray. Not here. So far away from Maria. Big trees. But the white river. Oh. My own, so far away. My family. You must please, doctor. No death. Not let me die. No, Alexis, your life is not all within my power. But for myself, I promise you, I won't let you die. Eighth of June. The fever continues, and there has been no reaction from the bowels at all. Everything the patient takes into his stomach is either absorbed or makes its exit from the wound in the stomach externally. The protruded portions of the lungs and the lacerated section of the stomach have sloughed off, leaving the large puncture of the stomach plain to be seen. The patient thus far has experienced no sickness or irritability of the stomach, not even nausea. Do you know what, William? I just don't know. It's just so hard to take hold of. Imagine. By all that's right, that boy should have been dead days ago. I'm surprised as you, Deborah, but the fact remains he's very much alive. But if he's in torture, I mean, all that suffering, all the pain, half his stomach open. What reason? You know he can't live. Where life is, I try to persuade it to remain. I succeed, I fail. The final voice is never mind. But this poor boy, what possible hope is there? I don't know. The hopeful, the hopeless. It's a grave question, but it's not my field. I'm a medical doctor, not a philosopher. I'm not much of a businessman, either. The there aren't too many that are pressing. Just three or four here. And this one. Well, and maybe this one here. And this one. It's really not too pressing. Is it, William? Don't you worry now. You hear? It's going to be all right. I don't think so, Deborah. And I'm not worried much. So it continued. The townspeople stood by and waited for Alexis to die. But the waiting stretched into days, weeks, then months. Alexis hung on desperately. He would not die. Dr. Beaumont examined and treated the patient daily recording every step, every observation, down to the smallest detail. So complete, so thorough are his notes, that even today they would be a credit to the finest hospital in the world. The 27th of June. After three weeks, his appetite is now regular. The stomach has shown not the least disposition to close its puncture by granulations. The 18th of July. The sixth rib, which was worst injured and blown off entirely in the first place, has become curious or decayed at its fractured extremity. I have been obliged to amputate it about midway between sternum and spine. I did this by dissecting around, separating and retracting the intercostals to the sound portion of the rib, and then sewing it off with a very narrow, short saw, which I made for the occasion. The operation succeeded admirably. 
To retain food and drink as much as possible, I have kept to the opening in the stomach a firm compress of lint, fitted to the shape and size of the puncture and confined by straps of adhesive. Under these dressings, digestion is as completely performed as in the most healthy person in the vicinity. I am even able to see digestion go on each time I dress the wound. After trying every means within my power to close the puncture of the stomach without the least appearance of success, I gave over trying. 28th of April. Today I have been informed by authorities of the town that they're not able nor are they required to further provide for Alexis St. Martin. He is a pauper, no friends, no money. They propose to pack him off in an open canoe to his native place, Montreal, nearly 2,000 miles distant. My protest against such inhuman disposal of a person are of no avail, even though the authorities are aware it will mean death for him. Happy are they that die in the poorhouse of this town. In my opinion, the public officers of the town would sooner pay a round sum for the extinction of a pauper than to make an exertion or take any trouble to procure the necessary assistance. Don't you think that's a bit strong, William? They really have a good excuse. They say the charity fund is low. The town just can't afford it. Alexis St. Martin's a human being. Because he lacks property doesn't make him less worthy of life than the rest of us. Oh, no, I imagine it doesn't. May the Lord deliver us from evil. And what greater evil could befall a human being than to become dependent on the charity of this town in time of distress? It certainly is too bad, William. I wish there was something I could do. Oh, there's something we both can do. Something we must do. We'll take him in with us. We'll give him lodging and anything else he should need. Oh, but how can we afford it, William? I don't mean to be selfish, but it means feeding him, clothing him, other things. How could we do it? You know the bills we have already. How could we do it? We must do it. No one else will. You clear out the attic. I'll move him in tomorrow morning. Yes, William. Just as you say. William Beaumont took Alexis into his own family in 1823 and remained with him almost two years. During this time, despite his salary of $40 a month, Beaumont nursed him, fed him, clothed him, furnished him with every comfort, and dressed his wounds twice a day. Then one night in the early months of 1825, suddenly, unexpectedly, the first glimmering of the grand idea came to him. When he lies on the opposite side, I can look directly into the cavity of the stomach and almost see the process of digestion. It is my observation that this case affords an excellent opportunity for the experimenting upon the gastric fluids and process of digestion. It would give no pain nor cause the least uneasiness. I may therefore be able hereafter to give some interesting experiments on these subjects. I have now found that I can pour water into the stomach with a funnel or put in food with a spoon and draw them out again with a siphon. I have frequently suspended meat and other substances into the stomach perforation to ascertain the length of time to digest each. At one time, I used a tent of raw beef instead of lint to close the opening in the stomach and found that in less than five hours it was completely digested off as if it had been cut with a knife. As the days follow, the patient becomes more discontent with his lot, not entirely without reason. All manner of digestible and indigestible objects are poked into the orifice of his stomach. He must fast for hours, lie in certain positions for long periods. And all this for the sake of medical science, in which the patient himself has not the slightest interest. Experiments began and continued in the year of 1825. The grand idea had come into being. It was only a start, a beginning, but it proved a firm foundation on which the obscure army surgeon erected his structure of incontrovertible truth. And as history will support, the final truths recognized were not easily attained. In the midst of some of Beaumont's most important experiments in late summer of the same year, Alexis St. Martin chose to embark on another of his vacations without leave. In the face of things, there was nothing the good doctor could do but wait and hope for the return of his most unreliable, yet most valuable subject. And in time, he did return. 
Dr. Malnami. I know you wait. I know you would be here. Ah, uh, this room. Same old place. I know you would wait for Alexi. You say nothing. I go away, I come back, and you say nothing, you do not welcome Alexi. Where have you been? To see some friends. Friends here, there, all over I got friends. And I have good time, doctor, very good time. We sing, we drink, we dance. Alexi have big old time. You should have seen it, mon ami. You should see it. You knew I needed you. Why did you leave? Doctor, to see some friends. Something wrong? I see it all the time. What difference if I go? It makes a lot of difference. You know that. I know nothing. What do I know of these, these things that you do to me? What for I should do it? To me, it is nothing. Why? Because you agreed to, that's why. You gave me your word. Then I take back the word. No more. I do it no more. You push, you poke, here, there, you put things in, you take things out. For me, this is no good. Only you. You find out all about Alexi's stomach. Maybe this is what you want. This is not what I want. Then what is it? What do you want? I don't know. I do not know. This I know I do not want. Maybe it's better if you give me some money. We, oui. you give me money, I not go. That's good, no? What I give you now is all I can spare. I have no more. I have a family to raise, remember? This is no good. That's bad. Mon ami, I like you. You are smart in the head. But also, I like the money. I need it. Doctor, we are businessmen, no? To you, I sell the stomach. To me, you give the money. This is all right. You not give me money, I not stay. This is bad, no good. You give me money, I stay. No money, I go. Mon ami. Be quiet. You drunken lout. You selfish, miserable, drunken lout. I'm sick of you. You dare to come to my house in the middle of the night stinking of whiskey. Stumbling in here, bargaining and shouting at me to buy something you should be glad to give away free. Doctor. I told you to be quiet, do you hear? I don't want to hear another word from you. You have a short memory, Alexis. Do you remember moaning on a cot over at the post hospital? While I stood attending you, moaning that you were dying. No death, no death. Je vous en bleu. Do not let me die, doctor. Remember that? Do you remember the days and the weeks that I took care of you? Every day? The weeks, the months, the years? The surgery. Working night after night to find a dressing that would keep your stomach covered so that you could stay alive. Do you remember that, Alexis? Do you? All right, and what did I do after I attended you, my friend? What did I do every day after I had dressed your wounds, fed you, comforted you? Did I come to you and say, Alexis, I do not like this, I want money, we are businessmen? Either you pay or you die? Did I ever say that to you? Did I ever say that, Alexis? Did I ever say anything like that? No. All right, my friend. Then why do you say it? Why do you ask this of me? It's the money, Doctor. I need the money. You've needed money ever since I met you. I gave you all the help and care and medical attention I could, but I never asked you for money. When you were put out of the hospital because you were a pauper, you couldn't pay. My wife and I, we took you into our home. Food, clothing, everything you needed. And did we come to you and say, Alexis, we want money? Either you give us money or we will put you in a canoe for Montreal? 
And most likely you will die on the way. Is that what we said, Alexis? Does that sound like anything we ever said? No. Then why do you ask these things of me? Why do you ask these things of me? Alexis, it has been a long time since we first came together. Years. Time and again, I've tried to explain to you what it is I'm trying to do. I know it was difficult for you, the language, the science. But I hoped you had realized at least how much this can mean, how important it can be. Can't you see it, my friend? Can't you realize it? For the first time in medical history, day by day, we are gifted with the sight of a vital organ in action within a human body. Never has such a thing been known or seen, but it has happened. It is happening now to us, you and me. Think of what this can mean, what we can do, what we can accomplish for everybody in the world to come. How much sickness we can prevent, disease. From what we learn from you, how much suffering and ignorance and death can we conquer? There are no limits, no boundaries. Your accident, this opening in your side, will make your name famous throughout the ages of man. Can't you realize this, Alexis? Alexis. So with things temporarily restored to normal and the inevitable hangover given expert treatment, the experiments continue. Experiments which were successfully executed almost in the depths of the wilderness, without knowledge for research or special education in the field of chemistry, without the aid and resources of shining up-to-date chrome and stainless steel laboratories, but with the most crude and primitive instruments and equipment, most of which he had to fashion with his own hands transferred from one army community to another, from Fort Mackinac and from thence to Fort Niagara, somehow managing to persuade his prized patient Alexis to accompany him, the $40 a month army surgeon, the grand physiologist from America's backwoods, plodded on and on with his experiments. And then while at Fort Niagara, there came one fateful day late in August of 1825. Oh? And one of the neighbors saw him on the road last night. Alexis told him he was leaving you. He didn't know where he was going, but he was leaving you for good. So he was gone. Alexis, the prized patient, the reluctant, unthinking backwoodsman, who unwittingly, perhaps unwillingly, served all humanity. Beaumont was stricken, but he decided to give to the world the results of the experiments he had made, medical facts and findings, which today, as they did then, profoundly affect the lives and health of every one of us. In August of the year 1829, after four years of constant seeking and searching, Beaumont located Alexis St. Martin in Lower Canada, and after much correspondence and many promises, finally persuaded him to return to him. And Alexis did return, with children and with a wife for whom he demanded steady employment. Thus the experiments resumed where they had left off too abruptly four years before. Even though a legal contract was drawn between the two men, it made no difference to Alexis. Soon there would be the usual drunken sprees. Again, the impossible demands for more money, more luxuries, more everything. And as suddenly as before, in the early months of 1834, Mon Ami Alexis made his final departure into Lower Canada. The last entry was made. A chapter of American medical history had come to an end. William Beaumont never saw Alexis St. Martin again. The one-time army surgeon who rose to the heights finally settled in St. Louis, Missouri. And there on a clear spring morning, the 25th of April, 1853, his last breath was recorded. A few years later, the body of his beloved wife, Deborah, was also laid to rest. And there in modest graves, they sleep together, side by side. William Beaumont, M.D., whose life work takes his place among the most important physiological experiments of his or any other age. Most of our knowledge of the human stomach today is traceable directly to detailed studies and observations of America's backwoods physiologist. Knowledge which establishes a broad foundation for the treatment of all the various disorders of the stomach, organic and functional. Knowledge which permits life-saving surgery of the stomach and abdomen, never before dreamed of. All from a crude 19th century dwelling in the backwoods of Michigan. William Beaumont, M.D., 1785-1853.